So, uh, John, you uh, have been a, a very successful uh, science uh, fiction author, and you're the president of the uh, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and, uh, and which is a, a, has been a great, uh, a, a great thing for you. Uh, tell us, though, a little bit about your newest book. Uh, what inspired you to write Red Shirts? Well, um, the idea of red shirts is something, of course, that's kind of in the nerd culture for a while. And for those who don't know what it is, um, back in the original uh, Star Trek, you know, they would go on a away team, and it would be like Kirk and and Spock and Bones and Ensign Jones, who is in a red shirt because red was the color of the security detail. And somebody there is going to die. Just for dramatic purposes, somebody has to die by the end of the second act. And is it going to be Kirk? Is it going to be Spock or is it going to be Bones? No, all of their uh, names, all the actors' names are above the title. You know, they're going to be just fine. It's that poor bastard, you know, Ensign Jones, who's going to get it. And the, the, the way that I thought about it was honestly, you think about it, you know, Ensign Jones is, is there to have the salt sucked out of him or to be, you know, blasted by a, a droid or whatever. But, you know, up until that time, you know, he must have done pretty well. I mean, he got through high school. He went to the academy. He, would, you know, probably had an interesting life. And none of that matters except for the very last moment where he's, you know, sucked to death by a salt monster. Uh, and so you start thinking about, you know, the lives that these people must have actually led prior to, to being cannon fodder, you know. And uh, so that was sort of the impetus of, of, of doing the book to explore a little more of that idea. I mean, it's not something quite obviously not original to me. I mean, everybody's sort of done the joke of, you know, the dude in the red shirts. But, uh, you know, the for me, it was being able to, you know, take what is basically a one note idea and see if you could actually build from it and actually do an entire story around it. Gotcha. And uh, in, in my uh, uh, reading of science fiction, I'd never actually seen the idea before. Were you uh, a little surprised that you're you're kind of the first to really focus on these characters. Well, um, in in a novel length sort of thing, absolutely. I mean, I, when I was first doing it, I was like, no, I would love to do a novel like this, but I'm absolutely sure someone has done this before. And you know, and I looked around. I mean, and there are examples of uh, books where people have been you know listed as expendable, including Expendable by uh, James Gardner, uh, which is actually a really good book. Um, so, but it's, so as far as it goes, you know, there's always been, you know, they've always had the the people who are, you know, not quite, uh, you know, not quite uh, ready for prime time doing whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing. So that wasn't new. But actually, explicitly saying, you know, these are red shirts uh, really hasn't been done before. And I was just amazed. I really was. I'm like, no one's done this before. No one is. No one has grasped this low hanging fruit and plucked it from the tree. Well, then I will do so. And uh, yeah, that's what I did. So, uh, one thing that's uh, kind of interesting to me when I was uh, when I had the review copy and I, and I was reading the review I wrote for Forbes, um, I happened to uh, go and catch Cabin in the Woods, uh, mm -hmm. which is Joss Whedon's novel, which is uh, also kind of a, a metatextual take, really digging into the lives of the uh, of the people who get uh, brutally killed in horror movies. Sure. Um, why do you think that this type of uh, uh, meta uh, storytelling, which you not only see in your book um, and in Cabin in the Woods, but also in Community uh, and some other TV shows. Uh, what do you think makes that so appealing? Well, I mean, I think we live in a, an era of sort of media saturation, where it used to be, like when the original Star Trek came out, it was 30 years ago, excuse me, 40 years ago now. Um, you caught it once a week, uh, or at least until it came on to syndication, but even then it was sort of an isolated thing. And, you know, you know, the little tribe developed and you could all be part of that, you know, that tribe, but it was, you basically had to make the commitment. And these days you have so much of, of everything out there that it really makes it easy to, you know, catch up on all the tropes, uh, catch up on all the irony, do all these sorts of things. And of course the internet in and of itself is this huge irony creating machine. Uh, so as far as it goes, we just live in, we live in ironic times. So making that sort of observation uh, really works. Now, you know, to, we can't say that we are the pioneers in this. I mean, even Cabin in the Woods, you know, owes something to Scream, you know, which came out, you know, 10, 12 years ago now. I can't even remember how long it's been. And there's always been, uh, 
you know, literature uh, and movies that make reference to what's going on in literature and movies and TV and, and what have you. So people have always looked back on what the culture is doing and saying and what's developed in the culture. Um, so rather than being a um, – this isn't something new. This is just a particularly good time to do this. I think we will eventually sort of retract and do – uh, other things eventually, and then there will be another wave of irony, and it comes back and forth. You know, the tide comes in, the tide comes out. Uh, one of the things that I, I really liked um, about the book is that uh, the, I really felt for the characters. You really managed to, uh, despite the fact that there's this uh, irony, a little bit of winking at the audience and breaking the fourth wall. Uh, sure. You're very true to the characters, and uh, and and there's uh, I don't want to spoil anything. But uh, there's really that's right. Don't spoil anything. Not spoil anything. Uh, but there's a love story um, at the heart of this really ironic book. And what do you think is the challenge of um, when you're dealing with so much irony, having some uh, actual uh, emotional connection? Well, I think it's actually sort of necessary. I mean, the idea is because otherwise it really is just one note, and it really is sort of farcical. And and the only reason, only way that something like this works in a novel length. Um, even a short novel, because this is a fairly short novel, is that you actually have to have real humans in it. Um, and in this case, you know, the, the, a lot of the fun is having this extraordinarily absurd situation. And how do, you know, how does an, a regular, ordinary guy deal with an extraordinary, absurd situation? Because it's sort of like the best kind of comedy to me is when the characters don't understand that they are in a comedy and everybody is just kind of going through their life completely deadpan and we on the other side of the wall are just laughing our butts off. Um, if, the, if the characters are in on the joke, so to speak, um, then it just goes, it becomes a little bit unbearable. Um, in the same re respect, um, if you create this sort of bizarre, freakish universe, you can't have so much of all the characters being bizarre and freakish because it's ju it's just too much. And so basically, you have to you have to say these are normal people in extraordinary situations, uh, extraordinarily absurd situations, and how do they deal with it? Um, and um, you know, towards with regards to uh, a love story, I've certainly snuck love stories in before. I mean, Old Man's War uh, is. Uh, a love story about a man and his wife sort of uh, cleverly uh, disguised as a military uh, science fiction story. So, um, I mean, you know, I like people I like people having actual real emotions from time to time. It certainly makes reading it uh, a little more bearable. Um, and then uh, one other thing that's unusual about the book is uh, you, uh, if you get the book, it's a novel in three codas. So right. there's a full novel, it's a complete story. And there, there are three short stories um, that kind of expand the tale uh, after the end of the book. And uh, why did you choose to uh, uh, structure the book that way? Well, part of it is that um, the novel works as it's constructed. I mean, it really is. The novel is meant to be sort of farcical. It's meant to be sort of fun. It's meant to be sort of self-knowing and observant and all these sorts of things. Um, but I think, but when I was done with it, I was like, "This works," and I'm really happy with it. But I, I thought that there were a couple of uh, not loose ends, but there were a couple of more ways to explore the implications of the world and universe I created, and to give it sort of a little more, uh, you know, emotional grounding in the real world, so to speak. Now, the the irony of the uh, codas is that uh, each of the people who are in the codas, uh, who are the main subjects of the codas, there's three of them. Um, each of them is a, a bit player in the larger novel, right? So in some sort of ways, uh, it's echoing uh, in a very consonant sort of uh, literary way what's going on in the novel itself because the main characters of the novel are meant to be uh, bit players in a larger adventure that is going on in that universe. And then these additional three characters are... Uh, in some ways, bit players in the in the adventure that our uh, main characters in our novel are having. So that was kind of nice. It was almost sort of recursive, uh, but it was also in the sense of um, it just seemed like a good way to uh, 
give a little more context to the universe, give a little more heft to what's going on. Because if you really are doing it from the point of, you know, these are real, you know, human beings trying to live their lives in, in really absurd situations, you want to make sure that you uh, sort of hit those notes uh, while you can. And also I think that it's, it's, fun to, it's fun to mess with the form. I mean, one of the things was if I had taken those uh, three stories which I thought were necessary and I tried to incorporate them into the novel proper, the novel would have been warped. It really wouldn't have worked the way that I wanted it to work. And so when I was sitting there going, how do I do this? You know, my brain's like, don't do it the normal way. There's no reason why you can't, you know. Uh, the novel police will not come to my door and, you know, send me to novel jail for violations of the novel form. Um, at least I hope they don't. I mean, if you hear a banging on the door, you'll know what it is. But basically there was like, why not do it this way? Why not try something a little bit different, see if it works? And to my mind, it works. I mean, obviously, you know, some people are going to like it, some people are not. But, you know, no matter what you do, some people are going to like it and some people are not. So, you know, I thought it was worth the uh, experiment. Okay. Well, I wanted to uh, talk about another thing that you have going on. Um, you have a Hugo nomination, yes. uh, which is uh, one of the uh, biggest awards in science fiction, uh, for uh, a short story you did for Tor.com called Shadow War of the Night Dragons, Book One, The Dead City Prologue. Right. Um, which, uh, which is uh, <laughs> hilarious uh, and, and a satire of kind of the overwrought fantasy novels. Uh, and just sure. curious, you know, what are your thoughts about getting that Hugo nomination? I, I got to tell you, when I, um, before, the way that you get uh, informed of your Hugo nomination is they send you an email to let you know what it is you've been nominated for and <clears throat> whether or not you want to accept the nomination, because sometimes people do decline nominations. Um, and so I'm, I'm sitting on my couch with my, you know, with my laptop up, you know, doing whatever it is I'm doing, and I see the email pop up, and it, and I just glance and it says, you know, Hugo nomination, and I was like, oh, maybe, you know, did Fuzzy Nation, which was the novel that I put out last year, I guess it got nominated. That would be awesome. And I open it up, and it's not for Fuzzy Nation. It's for Shadow War of the Night Dragons Book One, The Dead City Prologue. Um, and I, I, I just start laughing maniacally, and then I get up and I sort of start stomping around maniacally. And my poor daughter, who is, you know, in the room, is looking at me, and she eventually she goes, "Daddy, are you having a seizure?" You know, because it's it's just absolutely ridiculous. It was the story behind Shadow War of the Night Dragons Book One, the Dead City Prologue, is that it's an April Fool's joke. It is, uh, you know, meant to be a, a, a joke that we did about me writing a three book series. Um, based on, and the title of which is based on statistical analysis of the most popular words in science fiction and fantasy titles of the last decade. So, you know, statistically, shadow is the number one one. Uh, war is the number two most you word. So, you know, just sort of like that. And the fact that we did, and the story itself is ridiculous. The first sentence is 155 words long, uses the word black 11 times. Uh, and the second sentence is even longer. You know, it's just completely ridiculous. And, and the idea that people, you know, liked it enough that they actually wanted to nominate it is just, you know, A, you know, ridiculously awesome. And B, and I think this is one and B, I'm an idiot. Uh, and uh, two, uh, is also an indication that people are actually ready for, uh, I think, a little more humor, a little more of a lighthearted touch in science fiction and fantasy. For a long time, uh, you know, uh, it's been not necessarily the thing that science fiction and fantasy is known for, for being sort of lighthearted and amusing and, and, and such. And uh, so the fact that it kind of popped up said, you know, is, for me, it's the way of fans saying, yeah, you know what, this is not so bad, which makes me really happy, too, because Red Shirts is meant to be funny. So I don't want to... Uh, you know, um, I don't want my work just to be sort of dismissed simply because I'm trying to make people laugh as opposed to making them feel, you know, like, you know, this is a weighty tome full of weighty ideas. It's like, no, you know, there are weighty ideas that are actually in there, you know, when we're talking about the metafiction and everything else. But at the same time, I'm also going to try to make you laugh because uh, I like when people laugh. So I'm really, 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 really excited that uh, Shadow War actually got nominated for a Hugo. Um, and uh, if it wins, I'm just, I'm going to laugh my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's uh, funny you mentioned that, that people are ready for a, a lighter touch in science fiction uh, because there's been a lot of uh, commentary out, and I know uh, Neil Stevenson, as long as a few others, um, have been complaining 
that science fiction in particular has become dominated uh, by these kind of dystopian visions of the future and they're no longer inspiring. I, I was curious to know what your uh, take is that you kind of a unique position as being president of the FW, uh, SFWA. Right. Well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, uh, to, to be completely blunt about it, um, if dystopia didn't sell, we wouldn't have as much dystopia. Um, so in, in some sort of one sense, complaining that there's too much dystopia out there is not a criticism of the writers, uh, but it's a commentary of the times that we live in and that people really seem to like these dystopic views. Uh, so I'm not really going to criticize any writer who is going to, you know, sort of uh, work that side of the street because, you know, there's a lot of money on that side of the street. You know, there's, there's a very good reason to do it. Uh, and that's coupled with the fact that, quite frankly, um, some of the, the writers who are doing this uh, dystopic writing are actually some of the best writers that science fiction has ever had. So, um, so for me, it is not a, it's not really a problem that there's a lot of dystopic views. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the tenor of the times. At the same time, and one of the things that I think is correct about that is that we do have a tendency of doing basically what anybody in any sort of market-driven uh, field does, which is if dystopia sells, then we're going to put out three more dystopic books, and if those three dystopic books go out, then we're going to put out nine more in this sort of geometric progression of, and if the, all of a sudden it just seems like a really sort of dark and a horrible time. Um, and my feeling about that is that it's good to remember, it's good to re for us to remember as commercial writers that you don't have to just follow the latest trend. Somebody has to be the person who starts off in the other direction and goes, hey, you know, we also do this over here. Um, and if that is successful, then, you know, then that field opens up some more. I mean, one of the things that I, I almost, you know, I certainly actually kind of hope does, if Red Shirts does really well, then maybe that will uh, let people know, you know, that it's okay to write that funny book, it's okay to sell that funny book, it's okay to say this is a funny science fiction or this is a funny fantasy book and, you know, and sort of take a flyer on that. I would like to see more stuff in general just simply because uh, I think the field's going to be healthier the more variety it has and the more opportunity that readers have, not just the traditional science fiction and fantasy readers, but the people who might try science fiction or fantasy for the first time, that they have more choice. They have more doorways into this edifice that we call science fiction and fantasy literature. So, um, so yeah, that is my hope that um, we, we get uh, we get a whole lot of variety. So, yeah, I'm not going to run down dystopic stuff because, you know, I like it too. My daughter's out there going, I'm preparing for the zombie invasion. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're fans. Um, but it doesn't have to only be dystopic stuff, and I would like to see more stuff too. Gotcha. Uh, one thing that's a, a common thread um, in the writing on your blog, you're very transparent about uh, your business, uh, that being the business of writing. Sure. And I'm curious about your take. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, doomsayers out there um, saying that, you know, writing isn't a way to make a living anymore, uh, et cetera. <laughs> and I'm curious about your take, uh, uh, you know, what, on the business of writing. Writing was never a way to make a living. Uh, I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, the they, you know, 40 years ago when uh, uh, SIFO was brand new, uh, they did up, you know, they uh, some of the uh, – major people in SIFA sort of looked around to see uh, who in, in their population was actually making a living, like not having to do anything else uh, from writing science fiction novels. And out of, I think there were like at the time maybe about 200 members, they had five who were making their living full-time writing science fiction and the, the, the other 195 were having to do something else or were just eating a lot of ramen. Um, it is now 2012. Uh, Science Fiction Fantasy uh, Writers of America now has 1,700 members, but I think percentage-wise, you know, it's pretty much the same. There's a, sh there's a small number of people who are making a living being novelists, then there are other people who are novelists who make a living doing something else, and the novelist money is nice work if you can get it. Um, so in that sort of respect, it's the same as it ever was. The other thing is, is that, of course, people are panicking now because this is a new uh, world that we're coming into. The world is, uh, publishing is changing. And without 
you know, drawing anything away from the fact that the publishing world is changing and it is changing dramatically, this has happened before and it will happen again. Uh, 30 years ago, or actually a little bit more than 30 years ago, uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, was dominated by, you know, really cheap paperbacks that were, that they put in magazine racks. And there were six or seven hundred different distributors uh, around the country that uh, would stock those uh, would stock those racks in the drugstores and in you know the Costco's and wherever there was that they were, and then all of a sudden, almost literally overnight, that those 700 uh, distributors basically consolidated into two or three, uh, and it had a huge effect on how uh, the business got done. At the same time, was the rise of the big uh, big box uh, bookstores like Barnes and Noble and and so on and so forth, and so that's where. Uh, science fiction and fantasy migrated from these cheap, small paperbacks into the big, thick hardcovers that that we are familiar with uh, these days. Um, and it was because the market changed. Like right now, I have a contract that says I need to write books that are 100,000 words long. And it's not because the natural length of a novel is 100,000 words. It's because that is the size of a hardcover book that looks good, you know, in the racks. Um, with the advent of electronic stuff, we can make them shorter, perhaps. Maybe we can make them longer, perhaps. The the point of it is, is that um, this huge change that we are, uh, so many people are panicked about and feeling like we have to choose one side or another. Um, it is again something that we've gone with before. It has happened before. It's happening now. Twenty or thirty years from now, you know, we'll be wondering whether or not the direct brain implant is going to kill the electronic book. You know. <laughs> Um, the thing to do is, the way that I describe it, there are three types of authors. Um, there are the dinosaurs, the ones that are basically tied to the previous uh, distrib distribution model. They are going to die out. Many of them are going to die out. There are mammals, uh, and the mammals are the ones that rise up in whatever new economic model is. And so those are the people right now who, like, for example, have been doing a lot of self-publishing and going, see, this is how you do it. Um, and then there are cockroaches, and the cockroaches are the writers who no matter what happens, they manage to have a career, and part of that is because they pay attention to their business. Um, in this sort of uh, ecosystem, what you want to be is you want to be a cockroach. You want to survive no matter what the environment is, and part of that is a willingness to say, hey, things change. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Well, um, that is all the time we have. I want to thank you again uh, very much, uh, and again, it's just, uh, science fiction author John Scalzi, the book is Red Shirts. I believe uh, I quoted him in an article once as saying he likes people to pay money for books. So, <laughs> uh, so please do pay money for his books. I, I do highly recommend it. And uh, thank you again for your time. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.